Okay, Kaga desu ka, Watanabe dan desu. At long last, we're going to be talking about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It has finally been released, and I have to admit that I unwillingly went to see it. I was really sure I was going to hate it, and I was going to feel, okay, this is another example of Hollywood burning itself down through a bunch of virtue signaling and 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 bad movie making. And I've got to say that um, I actually liked it a lot. I think it was better than uh, Crystal Skull by a, by a very, very wide margin. And whatever post-production reshoots and cutting they did in order to sort of soften Phoebe Waller-Bridge and make Indy less of a doddering old man, uh, sort of like a remake of Harry and Tonto and stuff like that, it, it, it worked to the film's benefit. I'm not saying it's great. It still very much falls into that realm of a of a high probable recommend. And a high probable recommend is very, very bad news for something that is enormously high budget like that because it means you're going to lose money. But overall, do I think that this movie is going to be a notorious capper to the Indiana Jones series or do I think it's 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 going to be suitable? I think it's going to be suitable. I think it's it's an okay wrap up for it. However, it does point out a lot of things that are going on in Hollywood right now that I think are very, very, very worth exploring because they are definitely pointing toward the way the industry is going. And I must say a word of thanks to Stephanie Janizek and Lee Scott because both of them with the one-two punch have given me the inspiration to actually figure out what my thoughts were on this movie because they were very confusing i have to say because there were moments of it that got me so angry i thought i was going to rip the screen up but overall there were so many other moments that were like oh no 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 this is fine this is fine i can forgive the bad stuff in it because this good stuff is actually more than enough to compensate for those those momentary irritations so let's talk first about the mega trend one of the interesting things about the entertainment industry is it always gives both cultural and industry-wide signs when there's a lot of stuff about to change very radically. One of those signs is when a bad movie does phenomenally well, because that means it's filling in a cultural gap that even the movie makers might not have been aware was there. Perhaps one of the prime examples of that was the very enormous success of not only First Blood, but Rambo, because those two movies came out when it was still very fashionable to look at Vietnam as an unmitigated disaster and that the people who went over there as somehow being, they weren't looked at as villains any longer, but they still weren't looked at as potentially heroic. But the wild success of those movies showed that you could then turn around and make a movie like a Born on the Fourth of July or a platoon and have it work. Now, I know people say, well, The Deer Hunter and Apocalypse. No, because, because The Deer Hunter was kind of an art movie that, that pulled a scam in order to win Best Picture, i.e. It was only shown in a couple of theaters. They made sure that all of the publicity was that it was over three hours long and that it was good for you. And then it had a wedding scene that rivaled the wedding scene in The Leopard. Those are all things that anyone who's in the business seriously said, there's no way in hell I'm going to go see that movie, but I will vote for it for Best Picture because it's clearly one that shows what a wonderful human being I am. The other uh, indicator, a, a bad movie doing well, Blair Witch Project was another example, is a good movie that does badly. And I'm going to say that Indiana Jones falls into the later category. And I'll give you a parallel example for it. In the late 60s, when we saw the musical genre failing very badly with a lot of embarrassing things, there was one movie that had a delayed release because of contractual obligations, and that was Hello, Dolly. It actually should have been released right at the heels of, of Funny Girl. But because 20th Century Fox was so eager to get that property because of the success of Sound of Music and before the failure of, of Camelot, that they were uh, willing to be a little bit stupid. And one of the contract stipulations was they could not release the movie until it was done with all of its Broadway 
uh, playouts, which included all every single old female star coming in and doing it and doing a version. Ginger Rogers, Martha Ray, Ethel Merman, Pearl Bailey and Cab Calloway. And there was even some witty, uh, uh, bitchy talk about how they would do a version with Liberace. So, so finally, 20th Century Fox was able to release it. But by that time, there were so many failed musicals. You had Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You'd had, uh, you'd had Star. You, you'd had Camelot. You'd had so many of these big, high-profile things just laying the biggest eggs that, that, that when Hello, Dolly! came out, and it was good, but it wasn't great. In the same way Indiana Jones is good but not great, it failed. Although today, when you look at it, it holds up really well because its craftsmanship is spectacular. But like Indiana Jones, it relied on a lot of stuff that was burning out. So it was unable to overcome that not excellent, not definite recommend gap. And that's the difference between being able to make your money back and losing a sh your, your shirt. And, and with Hello, Dolly, the big problem with it was that it relied way too much on the musical numbers, especially the spectacle of the musical numbers, not the singing, which was always the real appeal of musicals, not the dancing so much, especially the more it became a chorus boy type thing. And Hello, Dolly has a lot of that. And in the case of Indiana Jones, which was also the case with Ant-Man, which is also the case with way too many movies today, there was an over-reliance on CGI. And in the same way that musical numbers used to be considered the main draw, not the story, not the emotion, but the musical numbers. Right now, you have this mistaken notion that you don't need to have a good story. You don't have to need to have good emotional moments. All you need to do is wow the audience in the aisles with spectacular CGI. And that is about as cockamamie a mistake as you can get. And... The things that made Indiana Jones work are not that at all. In fact, the things that made Indiana Jones work were the same things that make Hello, Dolly! look much better today than it did at the time. And that is that, that the emotional moments do work. Barbara Streisand can still knock it out of the park. And in Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford's ability as an old school star Unfortunately, a generation older than Tom Cruise, so he can't, he really can't do the physical stuff the way Tom Cruise is able to still at the very end of his being able to do it, but he's still there. Harrison Ford's not. And yet, in the moment when he's talking about his son, in the moments when he is actually debating with a Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who, by the way, is almost scandalously slandered for this. Now, I know she's probably a pain in the ass in real life, but in terms of the way she works on screen, she works very well. She's no different from Karen Allen or Kate Capshaw in the ability to be kind of a masculine woman, a woman who is, is kind of out of step with the era that she's in, which is the 1960s, remember, in, in, in the indie movie. And, and 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 so she she she's actually appropriate and and her ballsiness is appropriate she's very Catherine Hepburn in this I don't like Catherine Hepburn but but I can appreciate when she works and Phoebe Waller Bridge works in that way now if they use the alleged original ending where it turned out that Indy's going to stay in the past and she's going to pick up his hat and, and bullwhip and have a montage of her doing all the Indiana Jones stuff because now she's the real Indy. The whole thing would have been, I, I, I would have been one of those people getting up and I would have gone up to the screen and started tearing it up because, because that would have driven me so insane and, and filled me with such rage. But whatever calmer heads prevailed and stopped that from happening, congratulations, you saved the movie. So, so, and, and congratulations on whoever got in there as an editor and took out uh, the alleged extra scenes where Indy was made to look like an idiot. They appreciate his age in this, but not only did he have a good scene there, but that last scene right now with Karen Allen is a perfect button. 
I don't care if it was shot at the last minute. I don't care if you can tell that it was a last minute addition. The bottom line is it, it it's a perfect, nice, smooth ending to this. And for us altar cockers who actually saw the Indiana Jones movies in real time, saw Harrison getting older, realized that it was ourselves, that ending where you see both sides willing to take a step back, I'm going to say works with its key. Once you work with the key, you can expand to the other audiences. Now, let's talk about what are some of the things that the failure of this movie are blamed on that are false failures. They're, they're somewhat correct, but, but the nuance of the answer is wrong. And where it's fascinating is because I was in the industry about 10 years longer than both Lee or Stephanie, because I'm just older, um, I have an additional step of knowledge in, in, in how Hollywood was operating in the past. So I saw what led to the consequences that drive them forward. So, 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 so that's where I'm going to try to fill in certain gaps today. And, and, and try to explicate what's why some of the, the studio spin on what goes wrong and why some of the, uh, the common wisdom is just a step off. It's not way off, but it's just enough of a step off to where enacting an improvement on it might be more difficult. Area number one, CGI. There's a lot of blame that goes towards CGI right now, that, that there's too many movies that rely on it. And I know I just said that, but here's the challenge with it, because that, that explanation alone is not enough, because there's certainly a lot of movies and TV shows that use CGI in a very, very expert way, especially in more mundane and more run-of-the-mill uh, walk and talk a pictures where you don't even realize it's being done because it's fixing things. It's, 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 it's repairing stuff that might've been a continuity error or, or a logic jump, but, but, but isn't something that's spectacular. So unless you're aware of what to look for, you won't really see it. So where the problem with CGI is, is that, it has led to laziness. That is the key. Because what CGI did is the same thing that digital cinema did. When you don't have to be responsible for film any longer, because you don't have that expensive cost of doing additional takes and the, the cost of the raw footage, plus the developing, plus all the other Michigas, plus the video transfer and all this other stuff that you used to have to do, then you don't have that sense that camera up is important. So one of my, my, my friends who's a first AD will complain about this quite loudly, that you say camera up and people are still talking and milling about because it doesn't matter. You'll have people do many more takes than absolutely necessary, which has a double whammy. First of all, you're, you're striving for perfection for stuff that really doesn't need it. Uh, sometimes if you have a dolly shop that has a little bump in it, you can fix that in, in, in by, by CGI or even leave the bump. Who cares? Uh, as the great editor, Vernon Field said, you cut for performance first, character second, continuity third, and perfection fourth. So so you 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 don't have to have the visual that perfect. But what ends up happening is that often in the quest to have the perfect camera work, you now wear the air actors out because yeah, you're doing 40 takes of something that's cockamamie and, and not that important. Now, if the actor has to come to an emotional height at that point, they're having to come up with it that many more times. That wears out their inner energy. And plus, even though this has been the norm for the better part of 20 years, old school stuff doesn't go away. And the thought of your director and your cinematographer and no one else looking at you perform, but instead staring at the monitor detached from you, does not give the actor, whether overt or, or, or subtle, 
the sense that they're really being paid attention to. They feel like a meat puppet, which is insulting, especially if they've just given a great performance. You say, oh, we had a dolly bump. Sorry, start over. Instead of just letting them finish the scene and maybe use it anyway, or maybe use part of it. There's so many things you can do. So because CGI is there, you now have sloppiness on the set. You'll have someone do a take and there's a C stand in the shot. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll take it out in post. Or you have a lighting effect that's not correct or the, the lighting is slightly off. So, so your actor looks a little more haggard than they need to. And the answer is we'll fix it in post. So that continual refrain of it doesn't matter if there's a coffee cup in the shot. It doesn't matter if there's a C-stand in the shot. It doesn't matter if we see the shadow of the camera. It doesn't matter if we have whatever the mess up is, we can fix it later. Plus we can do an, any number of shots because it doesn't matter how many shots we do. People become sloppy. This is why starting people off in low budget is so important. You start someone off in low budget where you don't have the money to shoot for 80 days. You have to finish it in 12 to 20. That's a real tight schedule. You learn how not to waste time. And, and not wasting time creates energy. It, 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 it creates a sense that you have to do it right. And, 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 and that begets a certain level of responsibility among everyone who's there. And I'll tell you something else. One of the areas in Indiana Jones where I'm going to disagree with most of the cri critics, and this is a CGI thing, is that a lot of people say that they love the beginning because it gave them the sense they were watching an old school indie movie. Yes and no. The problem with that beginning is that it relied so heavily on CGI and we knew that Harrison Ford was 80. And so you see him younger and your mind subconsciously is de is is de de aging him in as you're watching it and as you're watching it you can tell when it's not Harrison Ford's body being used because he moves ever so slightly differently and it's a nuanced move that's slightly different not 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 something that 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 is big I mean the, I, I'm handing it to the actor that they did a good job of it whoever the body stunt was but. It still wasn't Harrison because there's a there's a multitude of just little things. And here's the other. And when everybody says we got to worry about AI, if what they did to Harrison Ford, which we know is the peak of, of that particular technology, is any indication. Artists and humans have nothing to worry about because every nuance in Harrison Ford when they de-aged him in terms of what he looked like when he was younger, was ever so slightly in that uncanny valley. And as you know, in the uncanny valley, the closer you get to perfection, the more the gaps stand out. It's just like when you're looking at the Irishman and you're looking at these three men in their 70s who for some reason are wearing digital masks of their younger selves, but are still walking like three men in their 70s. So it's it's it, it, the same thing's happening with Harrison. I much prefer him in his older style. Now, here's where the movie missed hitting that excellent definite recommend. If you remember Space Cowboys, they made a little bit of fun of the person's age, but I think there was so much pushback that Phoebe Waller-Bridge was going to be this kind of school marmy type nurse ratchet to this old man that, that, that they wouldn't deal with his actual physical limitations. And, and, and yeah, I think, especially in, in, in one of the scenes in, in, in this library type setting, that that if he had been, oh, I, I I can't do this stuff. I mean, I, I can't run up these steps anymore. You, you just put in a couple of acknowledgments like that. And yeah, they they have it very slightly in there, but it's not played consistently. So therefore, it 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 it, it stretches credibility in 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 some of the most extreme ways that um that I I think if they just 
not overdoing it, not making him seem like, again, Art Carney and Harry and Tonto, but but appreciating his 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 age, the way Space Cowboys did. I think that could have pushed it maybe that that little bit further. The other thing that seems to be used as a common thing is that sequels are a drug on the market and then people are getting really sick of these franchises that are burned to the ground and have their sprockets run off and that's true because once you started having the streaming networks and you started not having any gap between the feature films the tv series the next tv series the tv series after that and the next feature film you don't have time to miss it and a lot of times missing something is a big part of what makes it work what 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 makes it come together what what uh, what, what gives it value i'm going to say that the gap between the the two miles morales movies made me miss miles morales so i was very primed to see this film now if there had been a dozen tv shows and other other things with him in that interim I would probably not be as tolerant of, of that movie. And I would probably be bitching about it a lot more than I am. The other trick with a sequel to work, and this is very difficult, but, but what makes a sequel work, and it's going to sound counterintuitive, is when it's a different genre than the original. Now, let me take you back to the quintessential example of that. Godfather and Godfather Part 2. I happen to still think The Godfather was a better movie, and I get into fights with people over that. But The Godfather original is an adaptation of a tacky novel. And as an adaptation of a tacky novel, it upgraded it, and, and it took it to a different level. But it was still very much a very solid American, very honorable adaptation of a bestseller. Along the lines of Gone with the Wind, and along the lines of other faithful adaptations of stage plays, such as uh, such as Sound of Music or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. But it was still very much in that realm. What was Godfather Part Two? Godfather Part Two was a European art film. Godfather Part Two is nonlinear. It's very Lucchino Visconti, who ironically seems to have mixed with Michelangelo Antonioni. And you put those two distinctly different personality types together and, oh, and Sergio Leone. So you, you, you take those three different personality types and put them together and you have this quintessential European art film. It's nonlinear. It's very into the destruction of a good man and, and, and how his life becomes meaningless, sort of like Burt Lancaster in Visconti's uh, the Lampert, and 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 you're seeing that regret about everything, but you still have the stylization of Antonioni, and you still have that extra violent side that that Sergio Leone brought in. So so it was a different genre. Now look at Alien. The first Alien is a haunted house movie, and as such, it's not that different from. The Haunting, you know, with Julie Harris and Richard Johnson, where you're in a haunted house. Only this haunted house happens to be a spaceship. But it's still a trap. It's still something where there's nefarious demons. Not only the creature, but the corporation that has put them on this. So, so you have multiple villains in it. But it's still haunted house. What is Aliens? Aliens is an action adventure movie with a lot of spectacle. It's a lot more along the lines of Gunga Din than it, or Raiders of the Lost Ark than it is a horror movie. So that, dis, that, that difference made it also great. Now, Fincher did something bold with Alien, uh, with Alien 3. Unfortunately, it was so bold and it was so off and it was so out of expectation that because people weren't into Fincher at that point, it failed and it kind of burned the series down, but uh, it has never recovered. But one of the things that was right about it, which had Fincher been at a later point in his career and had people been used to his style, it might have worked. 
And that was, it switched genres again. Now it was a woman in prison movie. And, and it had that sacrificial ending that a lot of those women in prison movies that Roger Corman used to make more, only this was a high budget, tying in with an orange is the new black type, type picture. But it was just a little bit too different. That's why it failed. But it, again, if it had been a different point in Fincher's career, I think it would have worked. I, I, I think it would have actually made money. It was just a little bit too off. What's another one? Another one is Terminator. Isn't it ironic that James Cameron is really expert at this? The first Terminator is a scrappy, low-budget, uh, AFM-style horror movie with that was willing to be muckraking as all get-out. It was definitely from the realm of Roger Corman and, and Hemdale and, and, and these companies that were willing to be to go for it in the old Hammer film style, the old I Was a Teenage Werewolf American International style. The sequel to it is very much like Ben-Hur. And I know that sounds ridiculously exaggerated, but it is. It's an epic. It takes advantage of the most advanced special effects and bling. And it is the better for it. It holds up beautifully because of that. It was a different genre. Note how every Terminator movie since then has just been a, an abject failure, because, uh, whether it's a failure box office wise or not, because they did not reinvent the genre. Now, finally, let's go to the issue of the creator in the middle, because there's a lot of stating that that Mangold did a good job as a director on it. And I'm going to agree, but I'm going to also say that he was a problem. And this goes against the current mantra in Hollywood. But I think it's important that we have to look at truth and not at and, and not at textbook academia as, as 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 how to make movies work. One of the things that's wrong with James Mar uh, Margold as a director he wasn't a jerk. He wasn't an authoritarian. He wasn't um, a dictator. And film sets are not democracies. They're totalitarian regimes. They must be. You have to have someone who's got that real asshole quality to them that it, it can't not be backed by talent. You have to be so good that people will put up with your BS. But you cannot be soft. You have to be determined. You want to know what goes wrong with most directors who get pushed in above their usual pay grade as an attempt to put a checkbox as far as the studio is concerned for diversity and inclusion is that they really don't get how competence and and single-minded almost fascistic determinism is essential to being a good director what do i mean by that where does indiana jones go wrong where indiana jones really jumped the shark it was very early in the process and that was the moment when james mangold didn't throw the interference off the set and risk being fired. That's what a real director will do. If you have a sense that you have the gravitas of taking on this iconographic figure who's, one, who's, who's been the basis of one of the most important heroic character franchises of all time, and you have some idiot who happens to have a piece of insider gossip about what happened on the set of some movie decades ago and that can supposedly bring down big people in Hollywood. And you let her come on and bully you into destroying a franchise because she thinks it's fun to get back at the men who never took her seriously. I'm sorry, you don't deserve to be a director. There were directors in the 60s, of making bad movies like The April Fools, who would turn around and go to the producers from the studio and say, get off my set. 
and they would hire security to block them. And they would dare the producers to fire them. They're saying they and, and when the producers would threaten to fire them, they'd say, do it, do it. I don't care because you know why? Because you're going to make a fucked up movie. And I don't want to have my name on it. Trust me, they weren't fired. Because a lot of this is a kabuki play that, that executives will push you. And if you got an insane executive who, who does not have as their agenda to make a movie that will be good, please audiences, and make money, they are going to take your career down and you will be the scapegoat. So where James Mangold was a coward is he didn't bar Kathleen Kennedy or anyone from Lucasfilm from coming on the set. He needed to say, I am directing this movie. You don't like the way I'm doing it? Fire me. But he was afraid. So were the people who didn't stand up to Victoria Alonso. And that includes Chloe Zhao. Guess what? It's your own fault your career burned down. You're going to take on the mantle of being a director? You be Cecil B. DeMille. You dare to show up in set on, on, on the set with a with a safari cap and, and carry a bullwhip and crack it at an actor uh, if, if they look like they're not paying attention to you. I'm, I know I didn't say hit them. I said crack it at them to let them know, hey, got to do it. That's what makes Hollywood fun. And that's what makes trying to figure out what really made failure happen. Worth debating.